about to leave I'm ready packing Come with me I'm not really asking We'll get away To a place where we don't know About to see The world in action What we can be Life with no distractions We'll get away This is what we waited for Everybody, it's John here from Tutor to You. Welcome you along to another study live stream session for GCSE history. And tonight we've reached the end of the road, as it were. After many weeks, I think it's eight or nine weeks, looking at the Weimar Republic, we've come to the end by looking at how Hitler became the Fuhrer in 1934. Gone through all the trials and tribulations of this fledgling democracy that appeared after the First World War and is now on the cusp of being over overrun by Hitler himself. Um, warm welcome to those of you who are joining us live. Let me just have a look at the clock. We've got quite a few of you already here. I hope you're going to participate and answer some of our questions by putting the, your, your suggestions in the chat window on YouTube. If you're watching this on replay or on catch up, uh, welcome to you as well. And of course, you can take your time and pause at the appropriate moments. Uh, I'm joined, as I have been, all through this term by the two experts that have become well known and loved by all of you live stream uh, followers. We've got uh, Duncan in, in the middle of the screen and Hello. Rocky on the right hand side. Good evening both. Hi there. Good, good evening John. Brilliant. Shall we get started? Yeah. I'll hand yeah. over to you guys then. Here we go. Okay, so we're starting with a 60 second challenge. It's a bit of a recap really. It's uh, some key um, personnel um people that we've talked about particularly last week um and we you need to simply link the uh roles on the left to the people on the right so if you're watching live you can do that quite easily by just putting the letter and the number um so if you think that adolf hitler was german president from 1925 to 34 then you would put a1 you would also need to revisit that part of the course not that i want to uh, give away any of the answers at this point okay so we will 
put 60 seconds on the clock and see how you do. Couple of right answers coming in, well done. Okay, well, well done. I can see some correct answers in the chat window. There's a, a couple of um, A2s there. I've seen a couple of E1s, um, possibly some of the others stumping our live audience a little. Shall we have a look at the complete response? So well done. Those of you who said A2, that was correct. Uh, Paul von Hindenburg was the German president for this period. Um, and then we've got these three chancellors in quite quick succession. We talked about all of them uh, last week when we talked about how Hitler became chancellor. Um, and well done if you got them in the right order, Bruning, Papen and, and Schleicher. And then finally, um, as we discussed in last week's session, um, Adolf Hitler became chancellor in January 1933. So that very much sets the scene. And I'm going to hand over to Rocky now for the next activity. Thanks, Duncan. Evening, everyone. Hope you're all well. Um, so this this round is the picture grid. So you'll be faced with um, six questions, but these questions will you know, appear one by one. And then once the answer is revealed, so we'll give you a bit of time to work out the answer. Once this answers, uh, sorry, once the answer is revealed, you'll see a piece of uh, the puzzle disappear as it were and an image start to appear so not only do you need to work out the answers to the six different questions but you also need to work out what the image is and why that image is significant so uh, since Duncan set us up we're now looking at what happens after January um, very quickly after January once Hitler becomes Chancellor so can we have a look at the first question please Okay, um, so after a month of being in charge, the Reichstag fire occurred. What did Hindenburg declare and therefore give to Hitler? Now, you might want to think about your knowledge of the Weimar Constitution here regarding what the president can do, what the president can do on behalf of the Chancellor. Um, we talked so. about this a bit before, didn't we, about um, you know, president using these powers these sorts of powers quite a lot and yeah um that's exactly yeah and and certainly there's i mean good reason to um mm. within a month here uh, although there's a lot of people who like conspiracy theories like to think that the nazis <laughs> really did this themselves but you know uh, yeah I'm, I'm i'm not sure to be honest i'm not convinced um there's quite a lot about that isn't there whether it was what they call a full a false flag operation or whatever it's an interesting yeah. debate historical debate yeah definitely um yeah right we've got a few few good answers here right answers should we have a look at there great brilliant so hindenburg declares a national emergency and therefore gives hitler emergency powers basically this article 48 for Hitler to do what he needs to do or what he sees fit as chancellor in the interest of national security to get, you know, get to the bottom of this and try and root out all these uh, saboteurs who had the audacity to burn down the right stag. OK, great. Next question, please. So what does Hitler do then with these emergency powers? So you want to think about his instant reaction. So February, the, we have the fire. He's instantly given these emergency powers by Hindenburg. What does he do? Who does he target? Um, and then meanwhile, you can see we've got an ear. <laughs> I don't know if that helps you. <laughs> the cap might. Is it Norman Wisden? 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, sorry. Can't think of can't think of his link to the uh, to the right yeah. fire, so probably not. No, no. Hmm. Um, okay, again, right, we've got some good good answers yet in terms of who Hitler um, goes after and what he does with these emergency powers. I mean, even if you didn't know, you could have a good guess knowing who Hitler, you know, mm. doesn't like, who he campaigns against, um, and, and who, or rather reasons why people voted for Hitler. It's sort of, there's a common thread here. So, should we have a little look, please? Fantastic. Fantastic, rather. Um, so, yeah, imprisons communists, he censors the press, he runs a huge propaganda campaign about the Nazis representing German national interests and the fact that the communists cannot be trusted. So, yep, some of you got that as well. The communism is a regular occurrence here, a regular thread, always reappears. People are fearful of it and the Nazis hate them. OK, next question, please. OK, now... When was an election held which increased the Nazi vote share? What percentage of votes did they win? Now, I remember a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at certain percentage victories and um, mm. I forget which student it was, but they actually got the right percentage for this election, but believed yes. it applied to the 32 one. So quick election after the february right stag uh, after the february right stag fire when was it held and what percentage of votes were won ah okay so we've got we've got the right <laughs> got the right month and the right date and perhaps the the wrong vote share or the right vote share and the wrong <laughs> date but no, that's good okay should we have a look please brilliant yeah march 33 and then 44 percent. so hitler chancellor january right stag fire february quick election in march and obviously hitler's use of emergency powers helps him with his campaigning for that march election okay brilliant Fourth question, please. Fantastic. Oh, we've now got, we've got quite a lot of the image there, haven't we? Oh yeah, this is um, this is very very useful. Now it's one of those I would say. Now you can see this. You either know it or you don't at this yeah, point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the hat though, I think, tends to give it away. I mean, normally a type of hat that we maybe associate with workers, so that might help. But um, in March, following the election, Hitler proposes the Enabling Act. What would this effectively mean? So what would the Enabling Act actually enable Hitler to do? Okay, good. Some good answers? Yeah, I think the, uh, the, the clue is in the name somewhat. So we we'll have a look at the answer. Essentially, the Enabling Act allows Hitler to have essentially emergency powers in perpetuity, really, and he can rule the Reichstag, um, uh, sorry, rule by decree without the Reichstag. Now, he actually gets another Enabling Act he approved in 1937, even though it's a dictatorship by that point, but Hitler's obsessed with legitimacy. But or the image of legitimacy, should I should I say? But um, yeah, this enabling act basically emergency powers in perpetuity can rule by decree without the right stag. Now, many people would say as soon as the enabling act is passed, he's a dictator there and then. Um, but there are some, I would argue, there's some other stages um, that we need to establish as well. Um, great. Now he's only got forty four percent of the vote. So how does he get people to? approve this with the enabling act so which members of the right stag were prevented from voting because this is going to help boost these numbers isn't he if he's going to try and prevent certain people who he knows would vote against that i think we've had based on the answer to one of the earlier questions where he said it there's a, something a continuing thread i think that might be a clue absolutely Absolutely. Um, yeah, there we go. 
Start, <laughs> we're starting to see how hopefully we're starting to see because a lot of people are you know getting these answers there is a common thread throughout throughout this and the, you know obviously that's the nature of history but as long as you're clear about the timeline you can see how things reappear um okay brilliant should we have a look at the answer please i wonder if you've got the picture where nobody's chimed in yet and told me who is in the picture so that's great yeah so he bans communist deputies from voting and as well as some spd deputies from voting as well because he knows that those spd um deputies who obviously sit on the center left of the party uh, center left sorry of the right stag they are going to be against the idea of hitler ruling by decree so banning some of these deputies increases numbers within the right stag in order to get him over the line because he needs essentially a two-thirds majority to get this approved okay. i think the picture's pretty hard as you said before if you know it then you probably already got it and um it's, yes. it's really good so, whether you've ever whether you've ever seen the picture somewhere before uh, probably uh, absolutely if you haven't seen the picture you would definitely heard of the name i imagine if you've if you've covered the right stag fire then mm -hmm. you, you should have heard this name. But um, yeah, OK, so lastly, we know he's got 44 percent of the vote. He banned some communists. He banned some SPD deputies. Who does he actually then persuade to get the, the, the necessary votes to vote for the Enabling Act? Who do you think within the Reichstag he could maybe cajole and persuade to vote for him? This is a tougher question, but this is the key. Okay, a few ideas. Very good. Now, remember as well, the Nazis are the far right, aren't they? So they don't represent the whole of the right wing within the Reichstag. So who else do you think? Okay, lovely. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of people got that there with the nationalists. So we have a look at the answer, please. Excellent. Well done. So he gets a lot of the nationalists, the DNVP, they vote for hitler again this sense of patriotic duty or a sense of you know national security and this is a very subtle one but he gets the catholic center party to vote with him as well because he essentially says that he'll leave you know catholicism alone and he has no intention of interfering with the religion and and it's quite interesting actually because in 33 he immediately signs um a concordat with the pope like an understanding that you know catholicism will be respected so he gets those necessary votes he needs to push through the Enabling Act gives him those emergency powers in perpetuity and basically enables him to do what he likes when he likes. So, as I say, many believe that he is a dictator by this point. And the guy, the man, well, I say say a man, he is a man, but teenager, really. Um, anyone got it? I think, I think we've stumped a few people here. Um, mm. Should we have a look at the answer? It's uh, Marinus van der Lubbe. So he was the guy that was accused of and, and tried for and killed for starting the Reichstag fire. Dutch communist, 19 years old. I believe he was found with his shirt off. Um, I don't know why I know that. That's a bit random, but I'm pretty sure he was found shirtless. Um, but yeah, he was he was blamed for the fire. So there you go. Right, next. Now, a lot of these sort of we've gone through already. I really think that this chronology, this little piece of time is very, very important because it allows you to understand how Hitler escalates his control over the country. And it shows how the Reichstag fire feeds into the Enabling Act or feeds into the election, the Enabling Act. And then once the Enabling Act is in place, a series of different measures are then made. So all we're looking for here is a month and a year. That is all. Some of these are revision from previous um, sessions as well. So a month and a year. We could already, hopefully, do the first four. So in the chat box, all you need to do, you could just say, for instance, one as in question one, month, year. Okay, so we've already got, yeah, brilliant. We've got some answers coming through now. We've said, best, especially with the first four, based on our previous task, but it's always good to reinforce this and understand how things tie in. Okay. 
Very good. Brilliant. Well done. Shall we have a look, quick look through them, please? So the Nazis became the largest party in the Reichstag, July 32, when they had that election. And we looked at that last last time around in, in Hitler's role in becoming Chancellor. Obviously, Duncan covered that first task. Hitler becomes Chancellor in January 1933. Reichstag fire then is a month later, mm -hmm. February uh, 33 and yeah lots of people have got this lots of people are flying with these first three and and the fourth question to be honest the enabling act which we've just covered march then 33 and this is where things can get a little bit tricky but as i say there's a clear escalation here in this nature of control over germany so number five this one was tricky i didn't see any answers for this but I, I don't know if many of you know, but May is normally a traditional month associated with mm. workers. The trade unions represent workers. So a way I always remember it is, yeah, May 1933. And we know it's in quick succession after the um, Enabling Act 2. Um, political parties are banned. This is tricky, although technically it's a law for the formation of new parties. So no new parties are allowed. But within that, some parties um, basically give up the ghost. They realise it's pointless and, and it's tantamount to a, a widespread ban anyway because Hitler nullifies their, their uh, existence and their ability to sort of campaign and whatnot. So political parties banned. This is quite a tricky one. OK, should we have a look at the answer? It's uh, July 1933. And then we, we jump a bit here because there's a few key events in 1934. Um, and this is where you start to see number seven is really important. If you think about the Weimar Constitution weeks and weeks ago, the, uh, the Reichstag can be undermined by the Reichsrat, which is the, 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 essentially the parliament of local governments uh, made up by, you know, with the Lander, which is the, the local government. Now, what Hitler does is essentially abolish the lander and centralise everything. Um, so this one, quite tricky. I don't, yeah, I didn't see any answers. Just, I don't blame you. It's it, it's one of those you've either covered it or you haven't. Brilliant. January 1934. And then we see further escalation, Night of the Long Knives, where Hitler basically goes after the SA, goes after key personnel, Basically, key prominent figures within the Nazi party are killed to essentially ensure inter-party discipline. This is in June 1934. And then lastly, the final piece in the puzzle, the, pres the president by this point is ill. All powers have been given to Hitler. It's a dictatorship in, in for, for all intents and purposes anyway. But the removal of Hindenburg and the death of Hindenburg in August 1934 means that Hitler essentially becomes Fuhrer outright because there's no higher authority then. My students always ask me, was you know, is there anything sinister about Hindenburg's death? No, just old age, um, illness, and yeah, a matter of time really. So I think. I know I've gone on a bit, but I think if you look at these nine dates and you're clear about this journey over time and you see in quick succession how Hitler's working within democracy in July 1932 and just over two years later, he is the Fuhrer with no one opposing him, whether it be political parties or people within his own party. Yeah, I think it's, a, you know, it's amazing, really, when you look at this, this, this change. OK, thank you. Right. Last task from me. And then you'll be listening to uh, Duncan's going to take over for the final two tasks. Based on what we've talked about, you've got eight sentences. And I want you to think about this journey of how one event feeds into the next to try and create a perfect paragraph filled with key terms and detail and and points about this journey towards Hitler becoming Fuhrer. So rearrange these scrambled sentences to form the perfect paragraph so you obviously want to think about dates and key events first sorry duncan 
I was just going to say, sometimes it helps possibly to find the starting point because I think there's a lot there, isn't there? Trying if it, if we maybe reveal the first one, that might help people build it up. Fair enough. I think. Yeah, no, you're 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 right. You're you're far more generous than me. That's that's fair. So, <laughs> so yeah, the first one is the enabling act. So number seven. So obviously we're right. in March 1933. So yeah. So with the enabling act, Hitler increases his not uh, increased Nazi dominance. So now you want to think about again. It's about getting this chronology right. Think about what Hitler is able to do with this enabling act. Now, a lot of these sentences have dates anyway, so, you, you know, you could try and work it out that way. But it's very, very important to read as the sentences as well to see how they fit and how they link. Um, there's, a, there's a nice word as well for one sentence that basically gives you a massive clue as to what ends the <laughs> paragraph. Um, but yeah, this is tricky. There's a lot of information to get through, so we'll give you a little bit of time. I'm just going to say, you're saying the, the, there's a word that helps, but I can see a last Leander finally. <laughs> <laughs> and eight, eight feels pretty um, concrete a bit like a conclusion as well the break does but anyway. yeah that that's true although I, I would say with the lastly and the finally there's a couple of dates yes. a few words along there but is. no you're, there, there, are, you're, there are there are you're right duncan <laughs> you, you can tell i've written this because it's always oh, oh lastly finally oh and another thing so it's a bit like how i talk always just wanting to constantly you know add bits and pieces um but yeah uh, none of this hopefully will will come as a surprise to you in terms of the, the nature of the content but as i say what makes this a good paragraph is that the detail the key terms the the chronology the understanding um a couple of people have had a good go there i can see some yeah some they numbers have. have come through that absolutely looks close. yeah they've done really really well um should, should we have a little look then yeah yeah Great. So I won't I won't read right through. You, you don't need to. But obviously, remember, these these sources, uh, resources are, are downloadable. So, you know, feel free to download this and then you've got this paragraph. Um, so we look at the enabling act. Then we talk about April 33. I didn't include that in the previous one. I wanted to make it a little bit trickier, but they take over um, sort of uh, local government and, and the police. They don't essentially abolish the land at this point, but take over the police. Then they start to round up, you know, political enemies, communists, as well as, you know, Protestants, gypsies, homosexuals. May, the trade unions we've looked at. July, the political parties are targeted. Um, and then, yeah, perhaps for want of a better connective, I've put lastly, internal enemies were targeted. So they go after prominent SA members, which Duncan is going to talk about in the next mm -hmm. task. Um, and then, as I say, within just over a year, therefore, Hitler uses the law to destroy to destroy all forms of political opposition, and then finally you've got this death of Hindenburg. So it's important because it's symbolic of the end of you know if you like Weimar democracy or the Weimar era. But Hindenburg's death means that there's no one above Hitler, and he then gets the army to swear an oath of allegiance to him or an oath of loyalty to him, and yeah, he basically has everything he needs to be an authoritarian totalitarian ruler so yeah well done that that was good very good those attempts okay so we've got the conveyor belt question now so in a moment a number of possible factors are going to come or events um, are going to come past you on the conveyor belt and you've got to try and identify which ones of these were reasons for the night of the long knives now if you remember we've mentioned the sa quite a lot over the weeks these were you know the the stormtroopers this kind of paramilitary organization who were very central to hitler um uh becoming successful and the nazis um you know becoming uh successful um but have become a kind of alternative power base if you like and a, and, and a sort of internal opposition or that's how hitler sees them at this point and so you have this night of the long knives um where he 
you know, deals with the SA. Um, and so what are the reasons for that? We're going to see a number of possible reasons come across the screen. Can you try and identify the ones that are correct, real reasons? Okay, should we have a look? Okay, so we've got these six possible reasons here. If they, I mean, if they were all true, they probably would all be reasons, but they, they're not all true. And I've asked you to try and identify which ones were actual factors in the Night of the Long Knives. We've had a couple of correct answers come through. Um, so, yeah, well done with that. Shall we have a look? at the ones that are right. Yeah, so Rome had questioned Hitler over abandoning socialist policy. So the SA was a sort of more um, working class part of the uh, Nazi party, had still supported some of the earlier, more left-wing policies that had existed in the original um, German Workers' Party and the original plan that they put forward, which Hitler was very much um, abandoning. And yeah, there was that questioning. Um, Hitler saw Rome as a threat. Yeah, so many of the stormtroopers were loyal, not to Hitler, but to Rome. Uh, and the SA was very big. Yeah, it was a very big organisation. And so if there was some sort of kind of internal um, coup attempt, whatever, it could, it could potentially have been successful. So for all those reasons, um, Hitler felt it was important to deal with them. Is there anything else you'd add to that, Rocky? Yeah, just with number six, so th the role of the army is very important because, I mean, look, it, it seems so, well, it, it seems contradictory. It is contradictory, but, you know, this is, these are the Nazis we're talking about. So they, they, they often contradict themselves in search of power. But even though Hitler is a dictator and he uses violence and he, you know, abuses the law, he is also obsessed with this image of legitimacy. So he's very, very... Um, keen to get the army on side. Bearing in mind, Hindenburg hasn't died yet. He hasn't got this oath of allegiance. And it's the army who are very, very worried about the SA and mm. essentially, like you said, this paramilitary group causing trouble, you know, n not um, uh, overseeing or enforcing law and order. And, and it's the, the army that are in Hitler's ear and saying, you know, this is not good enough and hitler now is on this stage of well now i'm leader i need to you know i can no longer rely on the sa to be these bully boys on the streets all the time so yeah i think that this that sit point six is really important especially the role of the army there and and with the ss you've got himmler himmler is you know climbing the ranks very close to hitler and he is saying as well you know you can't trust rome you can't you've got, we've got to be careful with the sa we need to be more respectable if you can be. Hmm. Yeah. And then a final activity. Um, it's just essentially pick out the Nazis out of this um, lineup of figures that we've encountered, uh, encountered over the last uh, several weeks um, when we've looked at yeah, sort of the end of the Weimar Republic and the, the rise of the Nazis. Um, which of these people, these um, figures, were Nazis? Okay, so just see if you can spot them. I think there are a few we can spot quite quickly who weren't, um, who we know were famous for other other reasons, who we came across quite early on, um, before really the Nazis became 
hugely significant. So, yeah. Um, so I'm asking you to spot the Nazis rather than the, the not Nazis, but that can sort of help <laughs> help uh, rule some out, I think. There are a few that you can rule out quite quickly. So we're getting some correct answers coming in. Hitler was a pretty obvious one, but well done for <laughs> spotting Hitler. Um, and Goering, well done. Goebbels. Himmler. So a few people getting these. We've just been talking about Ernst Rum, haven't we? So well done for spotting that. Um, there might be uh, one or two we haven't. No one's, no one's spotted yet. Um, there, there was one that we did mention, and hmm. he, he he helped Hitler with uh, Mein Kampf. So that would be a test yeah. of memory. And we had we had a photo of him, didn't we? Yeah. 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 Oh, well done. Someone has got it. Someone has got that. Well done. Uh, spotted that one come in. Shall we have a look at the Nazis? I think there's... Yeah. Oh, well done. Got. I think we got... I think you got them all between you. So very good. Well done. Um, and well done for avoiding some of the others. Um, as mentioned, some of them like Kaiser Wilhelm and Friedrich Ebert were, you know, remember were, were definitely um, from earlier in the... Uh, course and, and and the story but there are a couple of others that you could easily have mistaken <laughs> potentially um so well done for spotting those very good just a final word to mention as we've mentioned before if you there are lots of study notes if you um get your smartphone out you can scan that qr code and there's lots of study notes on the tutor to website about this topic and other um, GCSE history topics, um, as well as lots of other subjects that you might be studying too. And we have got a revision guide for Weimar and Nazi Germany um, available, um, as well as similar um, books and resources for other uh, topics. Okay, so well done. Well, brilliant. Uh, and as, as I said right back at the beginning, that sort of like concludes uh, this sort of series of uh, study live streams that we've been doing on Germany post First World War, the Weimar Republic, and Nazi Germany. Absolutely fascinating stuff, and obviously. Um, very chilling in terms of the the way we've finished that there with, with Hitler uh, gaining absolute mm. power. Massive, massive thanks to Duncan and to Rocky for putting those together uh, tonight uh, and over the, the previous weeks. Um, and big thank you for also for, for presenting tonight. Massive thank you to those of you who have taken part on the chat window as well. We've got some really good answers to lots of quite difficult questions, I thought, at, at mm. times. Don't forget, we've already mentioned it tonight, but don't forget you can download these slides and use them as you see fit in your classes or in your revision. And this video is available to watch over again if you've uh, not enjoyed it enough already. <laughs> right, brilliant. <laughs> now, we've come to the end of the series and, and it's the end of term. We're coming up to Christmas. So we really hope that you have a restful, peaceful break. Have a good Christmas. Uh, and we'll see you in the new year uh, when we'll be continuing our uh, live stream sessions with a maybe slightly different emphasis in terms of topic and the way we go about out, uh, presenting some of the questions but we'll be back making sure that you GCSE history students get fully supported and get yourselves fully prepared uh, for the exams when they arrive sometime in 2022 uh, thanks to both of the gentlemen tonight. good evening to both of you uh, I hope you've enjoyed yourself yeah, thanks, Tom. absolutely oh, so brilliant yeah. stuff actually okay. can I just say if people want on the in the on the comment section rather than the live chat if people want to say you know if there's another gcse history topic that you'd like us to do some input on um it would be you know we've got our own ideas but it would be useful to see what you know what there's a bit of demand for and we can try and fit our planning around that as well that'd be good that'd be really useful yes a good point that took it okay good evening everybody and we'll see you again sometime very soon in the new year good evening yeah take care